I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, that's uh, Professor Mike Eaton of the Translation Advisory Board of Enetrends in Oxford uh, at the UK, and he will give us the explanation on the difference between kilo euros and micro or mini euros. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's kilo, kilo, oh, he's going to fall over again. Kilo euros and uh, millions of euros. Um, I'm Mike Eaton, um, and thank you very much to the organizers for getting me here today. Um, I've worked in industry for 40 years, and over the last 10 years or so, I've been involved in reviewing mainly nanomedicine projects across the world, and mainly in Europe. Um, and my origins of this, I suppose, I was part of the uh, ETPN, and whilst I was in ETPN, I realized there was a need for a sort of advisory service that could help academics and SMEs. So, with my colleagues, we set up, uh, after a long and tortuous proje uh, project, Enetrans. And within Enetrans, I'm part of the Nanomed Translation Advisory Board, essentially. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the function of it later on towards the end. But I think one of the issues really is the lack of success to date in really producing benefits to patients. Um, and there are, of course, successes, and my aim in life is to get more successes and more runners in, in the course of the race, really. So um, I will try and explain to you today at least my personal views as to what the problems are. And if there's one slide to take home from today, and that is this one here, really. And the real bugbear, really, from uh, translation is there's no real healthcare knowledge in know-how in academia, and this is a real uh, problem. And this often leads to poor projects, to ideation and selection. And because it's the same people involved, this leads often to uninformed peer reviewing and funding, really. And this is, this is a big problem. So I often liken it to uh, uh, tossing a coin or maybe getting a Greek scholar to advise and do the peer reviewing, rather than uh, maybe some academics who don't know what's needed in translation. So take that slide on board. So this is the process overall. And uh, what I would like, we start here with ideation, and Enetrans, though it's been asked, doesn't really involve itself very much in the ideation process. What I would advise you to do is to put more things in the bin before you start. And that way, we minimize uh, losses here and here in the process. So research goes from in vitro to in vivo, and at the end of this, what we see generally is something like 10% of those projects are developable. 90% uh, are not developable, so that funding is effectively wasted. So I think the thinking there is if you can try and improve things here, you will get better success back here. Enetrans was set up to help in this section here, but we have been involved very much in the R phase as well. Um, and, of course, the, the issue also is, if I move to the next slide, and people don't generally realize this, that the development process is irreversible. So once you're in development, you can't really, you're in development. You can't go back and do a bit more research and come back in because the metrics don't allow you, the costs don't allow you to do that. So <clears throat> uh, development is a very, very expensive process involving all of these parameters, and that's something where Enetrans does, does work in. Um, another thing you might think about is uh, the... Research is divided up into sort of incremental research or derivative research and fundamental research. And one of the <coughs> things that has occurred to me is that the fundamental research, the radical innovation, actually has an easier route into development, strangely, because it's got a much bigger USP at the end of the day. Um, differences between research and development. Many scientists think they're in uh, development when they're not. And a quick test is whether you know exactly what you're going to develop. If you don't know, then you're still in research and should stay there, basically. And as I said, development's not reversible, and changes are hard to a candidate in a preclinical phase. So if you make a better drug, do so. And research on a potential drug stops when development starts. Um, the guideline, oops, let's go back. The guidelines uh, really are on this paper here, which is free to download from Elsevier, I negotiated that from the Enetrans website. So the metrics and the phasing of where you are in R and where you are in D can be seen from this publication. I would advise you to look at that. Differences in training. Uh, development wants from research the very best candidate, but also to stop further research around the candidate. 
A research-based peer reviewer will not look for finality in a defined candidate, whilst an industrial reviewer <coughs> would not look for multiple options but a full specification and USP. Um, and the data requirements for development are much higher than for publication. <coughs> so, uh, one of the other issues is the cultural changes for development and the debate which often occurs in uh, industry is often missing there, I think, from academia. And it's really important to um, actively debate the metrics and the advantages and the disadvantages as you go through the research phase. And I would av advise you to do that as well. Many long-held dogmas are false. And one of the ones we come across quite often is the importance of clinical trials. And I would argue that maybe determining the USP, unique selling proposition, comes before clinical trials. That's not uh, the way people often think about it. The consequence of that is you get a uh, product that's not needed and uh, equal effectiveness is not a USP. So I've seen cases of successful clinical trials but no means of progressing them into, uh, into towards uh, the market. <coughs> uh, PEG lowers immunogenicity um, and industry knows this is untrue even if literature says otherwise and this is a, a constant reoccurring theme. And there's advantages uh, to PEG. What PEG does do well is disrupt aggregates that are very immunogenic and at very low levels. But if you look at a non-aggregated protein X, then it's equivalent in terms of immunogenicity by and large to a pegylated protein X. People also say PEG is um, neutral, but it's in fact an anesthetic and has anti-inflammatory properties as well. And also <coughs> produces antibodies or uh, binds to natural antibodies on its surface as well, so the reference there as well. It does no harm. Regulators look much more from safety than uh, safe than that. They look for histology changes as well. I will make it cheaper. This is a constant uh, problem, if you like. Um, and the cost of goods is a very small part of the cost of a drug. Um, so. And marketed drugs are very, very cheap to manufacture, in fact, so it's very hard to actually beat that. Um, but it is nevertheless to an, important to understand your manufacturing costs and the impact of the, cost, uh, the complex project process when selling a project. There are exceptions here, say, living therapeutics, where the cost of goods is very high, uh, rather than the super rich or the race courses, but that's uh, another uh, subject, really. Some of the other ones we frequently see. Polymers are challenging and expensive in preclinical, and I've had the uh, challenge, if you like, of taking one through, and it took us three years to do the PMPK studies on it, for example. Acid label products are really difficult uh, as you scale up and to specify, so I would advise people to avoid those. Rare and unusual elements, especially if none known in man, and <clears throat> nanomedicines with no practical route to DMPK studies. Multi-component processes, each one increases the risks um, and the costs, and thus the USP requirement. <coughs> IP, starting from others, IP is very problematical. Um, academics often start from materials covered by patents, and they get away with it. But a developer will not at the end of the day, and that, that is a problem. Uh, projects with unclear uh, IP ownership are still unfortunately funded and the, the pitfalls of using free industrial materials <coughs> under an MTA. This is also a problem. It's also important to protect an area of drug space and not just your candidate. Opportunities. There are many unexplored opportunities for nanomedicine. I would I urge people to think outside the box, use new materials such as self-assembly. I mean, it's very big fan of uh, John Mary Lenn, who was speaking earlier this week, and I think his approach has got a lot of merit. And I would also urge for more funding of blue sky research, and also diversity and increasing the portfolio management. Um, I think this drug space will be exploited. Um, there will be products and opportunities for those prepared to embrace development. But, and it is absolutely poss possible to teach old drugs new tricks. I've had people come to me and say, well, 
no, we can't take on all this development stuff, we don't have the know-how, but it's not true, you can, and I've seen it happen. But the pivotal players in the field are really the funders, because without their political support for development, the culture will stay rooted in research, and sadly, I think there's often likely to be the prognosis, and that's something Enotrans has to work against. So this is my uh, last slide almost, uh, really to talk about uh, the uh, TAB. We're here to help for free, courtesy of the European Commission. So far, we've looked at 66 teams from 16 EU countries and beyond. Um, we've, so we've selected 44 of those, and they've benefited from cloaching. Of these, 10 have considered to be high potential products or projects. And of those, you can see what we've achieved with them. One license deal, one startup, two funding rounds secured, and two funding rounds being secured. So I think it's been very successful. So lastly, I'll give you this slide to be provocative. If you want to build a house, do you employ an experienced builder or an expert in cement technology? And developers are needed, not researchers. So I'll stop there and take any questions. <laughs> <coughs> it wasn't a technical talk, please. Lou? Hello. Uh, nice talk, Mark, as usual. Uh, I would uh, emphasize the one other side, that it's perfectly normal for basic research being more, more uh, broad and less useful in terms of quote-unquote useful. So developers are needed in development, um, but researchers are needed in research, and the, the, the reliability of the data and reproducibility of the data, that is really essential. Uh, I see this 10% rate as normal, but what should, what is not really used is the, all the lessons learned in development and feeding back to the, to the research. So that's absolutely that's what right, yeah, absolutely right. Um, um, I guess that's something that Enotrans can do, is to actually, we have a lot of experience in development and we can use those points and feed them back. I've been involved in taking two nanomedicines to the market and there are lessons there and we, we see the lessons and uh, also the panel is very experienced as well. So they've got that history as well. Are there more questions? I'd say uh, USP or give the definition of a USP to my dean will be a little challenging, but uh, we'll try. Well, I, I, could, I could do that, if you, but, but I'm okay. sure you can do that. But I think if you discuss that as a team, I think that's useful. And sure. it should be part of undergraduate studies and teams to discuss it actively, not to take what the supervisor says mm -hmm. as gold. Mm -hmm. Um, but to uh, really actively debate what, what's going on there. Sure. And that way you get strength. But I think the opportunities of understanding development, uh, I think really what Lou was saying, you know, development is uh, it's a different area, but if you feed those, that expertise back into research, you get a much more interesting research environment. Now, I've seen this, and I was involved in taking one product to the clinic. It didn't go very far, but... The academic involved in that uh, subsequently got a lot of awards and medals and so on, and very nicely he came and said, "Thank you very much, Mike. You know, without me, me, you know, me telling him what was needed, he wouldn't have done that work, really. So, it works both ways." There's another question, Patrick. Thank you very much, Mike, for this great talk as usual. My question is because uh, Nanomed Tab is in operation for a bit more than two or three years now, two, two years. Do you? see an, uh, an evolution in the maturity of the uh, projects submitted to TAB. In other words, do you see, let's say, a change, let's say, from more academic towards uh, startup uh, files, and do you see, let's say, a change in the uh, TRL level uh, from, from the project submitted to TAB? Thank you. Um, yeah, the answer to that, Patrick, I think it is too early to say, um, but um, you're right. And my experience elsewhere, say in the UK, where I do a similar role um, for Innovate UK, is over 10 years we've seen a massive increase in the quality. Um, but it's taken 10 years. Um, so I think it will happen eventually, yes. There's another question there. Okay. You, you mentioned of uh, opportunities. I, I just want to mention that there are so much opportunities in... Uh, uh, 
drug for poverty, for example, neglected diseases, tropical diseases. A lot of drugs are 100 years old and they're still being used. For example, for TB, up to 60 years old, drugs are still being used. So these drugs can benefit so much by using nanomedicine. Uh, a lot of drugs in malaria which have been invented, they lack toxicity, they are toxic or they are not soluble. Uh, yeah. And by using nanotechnology, you can do so much and so quickly and, and actually relieve a lot of uh, pain in the, developed world, the developing world. You're absolutely right. Um, and in fact, there are. I've seen uh, nano uh, TB projects recently, and I'm involved in um, evaluating research in South Africa when I go back to the UK. But I it was just a comment. Uh, when uh, Mike uh, said that it, it would take 10 years to, to, to witness, let's say, the results, I'm very glad to announce that uh, the tab, because Inatros will be over in a couple of months, but so the tab will be extended for three more years under the Nobel project. So three more years, uh, uh, it will operate for three more years at least. Well, I was very encouraged by the success, of which I was on the previous side. You know, it, uh, we are actually seeing some... Uh, world-beating world projects, actually. There's some there which make your hair stand on end in amongst that 60-odd uh, projects. And a few of them are here today, in fact, being represented. Um, so um, many of these, of course, have not been published whatsoever. And so, uh, you know, I think they are there. So I, I'm, very, I'm very optimistic about the future, yeah. So thanks, Mike, again, okay. for the inspiring talk and the discussion.